Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to the grand round today, which is about the uh, visual formed area and the visual cortex. Our speaker is Dr. Tim Maigel. Dr. Tim Maigel is a faculty member in the uh, King Saud University. He's an assistant professor and gra program director of neurology department at King Saud University. He was graduated from University of Alberta. He underwent uh, Neuro, neurology training program in uh, Alberta, and also he carried a fellowship training subspecialty in neurology dementia, and another fellowship from Vancouver in neuroophthalmology. Dr. Tame is affiliated to ophthalmology department also, and he's doing a neuroophthalmology clinic in ophthalmology department at King Khaled um, University Hospital. And uh, uh, I would like you all to welcome with me Dr. Tame. He is doing an excellent job in also teaching uh, our resident in uh, ophthalmology at King Khaled University Hospital. And um, uh, he is one of the few neurologists who is doing the neuroophthalmology uh, subspecialty in a new in ophthalmology clinic, not in a neurology clinic. And uh, kindly, he, uh, he uh, uh, approached our department and uh, we welcomed him and we supported the idea of having a neurologist doing the clinic in ophthalmology department. And to be honest, we found it really successful. Uh, Dr. Tim also carries, uh, he has a huge interest in research and he carries a master degree in the epidemiology of health public. So um, welcome with me all, Dr. Tim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Majid, for uh, the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for um, having me here. I'm really honored uh, to be able to uh, talk uh, today to uh, all of you. Um, I uh, wanted to talk about something that I, uh, I found rather interesting and, and, and fascinating in the, uh, in the field of neuro-ophthalmology. And it's kind of uh, uh, meshes well together what I like to do, which is neuropsychological uh, uh, dysfunction as well as uh, neuro-ophthalmological uh, conditions. So I'm going to talk about the visual uh, word form area. Um, and I'll, I'll clarify what this is, but in, in summary, this is uh, a, an important region of the brain, and uh, without this, we would not be able uh, to read. And so what I'm going to do is uh, basically uh, just uh, introduce you to just the basic idea of, of scripts and, and writing for people. Uh, I want an identification of uh, just certain task-specific brain regions that are related uh, to reading. Uh, we'll go on how the location of the VWFA uh, has been found uh, and just uh, some of its basic functions and what's it like in people who have different uh, disabilities. Um, so all of you can look at these uh, letters. You clearly met in harf is seen and uh, the letter uh, D. And uh, without needing to think or anything, we can immediately recognize that the second letter that pops up is uh, sheen and uh, B. And all we did is add a few dots in one and just give a mirror image of the other one. And we don't have to do any type of critical analysis or thinking and say that uh, because this is facing in this direction, it must be a, a different letter. And the same thing, example, if I show you this, this is a penguin. However, the difference is that when you see it, you still call it a penguin. You don't give it a different name. So this is just uh, to highlight the uniqueness of the VWFA, its ability to identify things as something different without you having to think about it, just by a mirror image or adding a dot uh, on top of it. Um, some other examples is if you look uh, here, uh, this, is, this is the word rage and this is the word rage. They are not written the same. These are totally different uh, uh, letter forms uh, for, the, for the same word. Uh, you don't need to analyze it to pronounce it. And the same thing, you will always recognize in these Arabic words, no matter what way al-ha uh, is written, you will always recognize it as a letter ha and associated with the right pronunciation and the right uh, meaning accordingly. So. And there's something called uh, reading in invariances, which means things that don't matter that much when you read. If it's big or small, you're going to be able to, to read the word. If the f there's different fonts, we're all familiar with different fonts and handwriting styles, and we can read it all without uh, difficulty. Uh, big case, lower case, and position. Wherever it is on the screen or on the piece of paper you're reading, you're going to be able to identify these words. So 
I guess the origin of reading and writing is debatable, but it's thought that it, uh, the first evidence for reading was found in ancient uh, Sumer um, about 5,000 years ago. Um, it's thought that maybe even Egyptian hieroglyphics could have uh, originated uh, from, uh, from the Sumer, uh, initial Sumer script, whereas language has been around for at least hundreds or 150,000 uh, years. Um, so uh, this is uh, what they call a cuneiform type of writing, an ancient type of uh, writing uh, script, uh, basically in wedges. And it has, um, it's not exactly like we write today, is that not each of these represent a letter, not each will represent a sound, some might represent a whole meeting. Just like in hieroglyphs, you have uh, many, uh, many characters. They had over 700, 800 uh, characters. Each one would uh, symbolize a particular meaning. So when you, um, I can't read this, but if you say this one represents a man, you would say, okay, that's a man, and okay, this is an eye. Uh, some are clear, but some would represent an idea, like honesty or truth, and they would have a, spe a specific uh, symbol for that. And so, with writing in general, is that you have uh, phonograms and uh, ideograms. So phonograms is uh, when you have something you can pronounce. Like when you're reading English, you pronounce the letters. Reading Arabic, you pronounce the letters. Ideograms, you see it and you get uh, the overall idea. Um, uh, for most languages now, there is a standard orthography, which is the way the language is written. In Arabic, uh, our um, uh, orthography is considered an abjad and it contains uh, consonant symbols, right? The vowels are typically not written except in a few circumstances, and you usually use a tashkil or diacritics to know how to pronounce uh, the letter with a vowel. Uh, whereas English is different, and does not use the diacritics, but it does, has, does have letters and vowels. So if you take out the vowels from the letters, it will look strange and difficult to read. Uh, there are still some language scripts that resemble the uh, old ancient forms, like as Chinese and, and kanji. Uh, the Chinese is also is a character-based type of script where a character would represent the meaning of a word or an idea. And uh, kanji is a Japanese type of writing. They have two forms of writing. Like one is kana, one is kanji. This one is more also character-based and it's taken from the Chinese. So um, how we learned about the uh, uh, visual word frame area was basically from um, uh, functional MRI studies that helped. The PET scans were helpful and then later on development technology and functional MRI you're able to get more information. Um, so with, uh, with functional MRI if you want to uh, measure the activity in a certain region you need to uh, kind of identify that lesion and that's why the brain gets divided up into tiny little boxes. Each box is called a voxel. And these voxels are very small, about the size of a small peppercorn. Uh, there is a, um, a response function, a hemodynamic response function that uh, informs us of the region that's being uh, activated. So for example, if I show a patient a particular word and uh, I want to see if uh, the temporal lobe understands this word, where you know, temporal lobe is responsible for holding meanings of words. So uh, you would see the uh, time of the stimulus here is at the red. After a few seconds, you begin uh, to see the oxygen uh, level increase, and that causes that change in the oxygen causes a magnetic signal that the MRI uh, can detect. And then after uh, about five seconds, you'll see that peak. So it is delayed after the stimulus. And then later on, it will uh, return back uh, to normal after time. So that's the, that's the basic part of uh, measuring. That's the signal that's measuring. You're measuring uh, the increase in blood flow that happens to that particular brain area uh, to help interpret what it's uh, uh, seeing. So uh, just a few technical issues with fMRI because it's not a perfect tool. There's, uh, it's very coarse. Uh, you don't get very clear resolution. Sometimes regions are overlapping regions, and so they're very tightly connected to each other, and there might be function that's shared, uh, and not just location where the neurons are kind of intermingled with each other. Um, Non-word stimuli, for example, like I give a, a detailed picture, uh, might, you know, could uh, stimulate neurons that are responsible for interpreting words. Um, and then increase in the fMRI activation may reflect stronger uh, neural coding, but also increase top-down activation. So top-down activation basically, I mean, 
um, when I see a word and I recognize it, then it's interpreted in other brain regions that are responsible for the meaning of words. So this could affect a top-down effect. That means it comes from a higher brain center down to the visual center and gives uh, a response. <coughs> so it's been described by a few ways. It's been described as a localized region of the uh, left occipital temporal sulcus, just lateral to the fusiform uh, gyrus, systematically takes on the function of identifying visual letter strings. Letter strings is just basically letters in a row. Uh, when you put letters in a row, you just call it uh, letter strings. And, and a nice summary for it uh, was an orthographic lexicon, le lexicon. So lexicon can have a meaning of, uh, of a dictionary. Right, so everybody has their own lexicon in their brain. All the words you know are present in your lexicon, which is in temporal parietal regions. And so there is also an orthographic lexicon, which is means, so if anybody thinks of a word, they're gonna you know, subconsciously think of how it's spelled in their head at the same time. And so that orthographic uh, lexicon is probably stored in the uh, visual word form area. And uh, this is the bottom surface of the brain. Uh, this is the left side. Uh, there are some studies that give you a mirror image, so I'll have to clarify that when it comes. But right now, usually things are on, th this is the left hemisphere, and this is going to be represent the right side. This inferior part of the occipital uh, temporal region is where we tend to find uh, the visual word form area. Okay, um, just want to talk about, uh, before I go more into the visual word form area, I just want to talk about uh, facial recognition because it's almost homologous to the visual word form area. Uh, area responsible for seeing faces where the smiley face is, uh, fusiform uh, uh, gyrus, and this is the fusiform gyrus on the other side for, for reading. Uh, but <coughs> this has a strong sensitivity to uh, faces. And so, uh, same thing, when we look at anybody, when we see anybody we know, we recognize them right away. We don't have to say their eyes are this far apart, uh, the nose is bent this way, and the lips look like that. We can immediately f just collectively, holistically, just look at the face and know what it is. And that's because of this region here. And so, for the typical observer, of course this happens in merely a very, very short time, is, for example, with these, uh, this was done on a normal observer and a person with uh, prosopagnosia, which is impaired facial recognition. So there are actually patients who will have disorder with lesions infect this area and they can no longer recognize faces. Um, so uh, for the typical observer, they might be able to get a uh, picture here of uh, Agassiz or uh, Nicole Kidman right away, uh, but it happens, this happens in a very uh, quick time. Whereas somebody with prosopagnosia who has some impairment will have to do that bit by bit processing of the face. So maybe after some time looking, they were barely able to get out uh, the mouth of the person they were talking to or barely able to get uh, the eye uh, of the person they're trying to, to look at. And so that's what happens again. Uh, sim the same thing is kind of happening on the other side when there's uh, impairments in, in word recognition. And I'll talk about that a bit more detail. So. <clears throat> Why is there even a visual word form area? Um, this has um, disturbed uh, some of the uh, uh, scientists doing research in this area. Is that why, why is there a, a visual word form area? Um, because um, uh, they're basing their explanations on, on the theory of uh, evolution. So language was present for over 150,000 years because it served an evolutionary purpose and communication and such. But uh, it emerged 5,000 years ago. That's not enough time for uh, uh, evolutionary process uh, to take place. So, <clears throat> from, from, so they approached it from that side and tried to figure out why. And they were able to find out that uh, there's, some, in their opinion, a hypothesis which is about neuronal recycling. And uh, they're saying that the visual word form area was always providing some type of function, uh, perhaps uh, adopting from uh, different uh, scenery, sceneries, different uh, areas uh, that we see uh, in our daily uh, basis and angles and curves and, and other types of figures that have to be uh, analyzed. And uh, this uh, happened to fit uh, well with the requirements uh, for reading. Um, so there was probably a pre-existing cortical system that was harnessed for new task of recognizing, and then it was harnessed and used for recognizing new words. Um, the recycling view predicts that reading acquisition should always occur at a reproducible localization uh, and with a functional specialization for reading specific processes. 
although not necessarily with full regional specificity, because both word and object recognition may still be intermixed. And we've seen that. We've seen a lot of studies that look at words and look at objects. And while object recognition is a bit more lateral, you do see uh, overlap between these two. So the reproducible uh, localization aspect of it is that uh, with repeated studies, they've always found that uh, you know, just within a few millimeters, they uh, stimulate the same site. Uh, they see it across different cultures and languages. There is a preference um, for high-resolution foveal shapes and line configurations, as I mentioned. Um, and there's also interconnection with the other regions that are important uh, for language. Um, so, and that part I'll, I'll talk about a bit more in, in one of the coming slides. Um, for uh, functional specialization, we know that the VWFA is uh, sensitive to bigram frequency. What is bigram frequency? Basically, there are some letters that always tend to come together. Two letters, for example, في بداية الكلمة الألف واللام في التعريف. In English, you might get T and H frequently comes uh, together and has a different uh, pronunciation. So the video can, can recognize not just an individual letter, but can identify sometimes letters when they come two at a time or they come three at a time. Um, it might even be able to understand uh, morphemes like a, a short part of a word or just like a small word in the reader's language, like um, and might have its own uh, neurons that can recognize the word and, for example. Um, as I mentioned, you can distinguish between a uh, word and a mirror image. And uh, similar specialization for, in these neurons is also seen uh, for uh, Chinese characters, which, which are very numerous. Um, and so this is a nice uh, study that was looking at the difference between uh, words and uh, objects, just to trying to see if there's a bit of a difference between that. And when they tried to match uh, the stimuli as best as they could, so you've got the word uh, stimuli, it was kind of, uh, they had some clearer words and they had some bit broken down words. Uh, scrambled words which are hard to inter interpret and scrambled objects. So these act like a control, like showing the patient something uninterpretable, and then they show them something they can interpret, like, uh, a basic drawing of a car or a basic drawing uh, of a word. And they still found when they broke it down to just basic elements, they still found that uh, words uh, had a much higher signal. There was much more activation in the left uh, VWFA uh, compared, uh, compared to uh, objects. So as I talked about, uh, talking about the region is important. Why is it tends to be on the left side, for example? Why is it always reproduced with some area? There is a thought that there are biases or constraints in the brain that because ev people are left side dominant, language is usually on the left side, then the VWFA is probably going to be left side because it can connect directly with the language centers in the temporal area and in the frontal motor areas part of expressive speech. Um, uh, there is, uh, the green line here represents link to the parietal lobe that uh, also has an importance in recognizing digits and numbers. Um, so there is um, a model that is proposed for how um, neurons tend to identify. And as I mentioned earlier on, there seems to be a hierarchy where basic shapes, basic figures are recognized first, and then later on uh, more complex bigrams might be recognized or even trigrams, and then small words uh, as you go on higher. So a gradual uh, scale. And so these things become, let's say, each neuron kind of identifies a certain thing and everything is assessed at the same time in parallel. So this component of the word was seen, this component of the word was seen, and they are processed at the same time immediately and you recognize it as a single word. So um, even in fluent readers, uh, there is a continued response to other their visual categories, but uh, like objects, but uh, it is best uh, for uh, reading. And I'll show you this nice example. Uh, they had a group of patients of different degrees of uh, literacy. So we'll start with the purple people who are completely illiterate, and the green one people who are highly literate, very expert readers. And so <clears throat> uh, we're looking at how many words they could read per minute. In general, this is just an assessment. Of course, the illiterates couldn't read anything, while the highly literate were able to read well. Um, so when they looked at uh, the left VWFA, the part responsible for identifying words, uh, in the bottom here you can see they tried uh, faces. Uh, they didn't find that specialization. They found that uh, illiterate people would recognize faces quite prominently. 
in the left VWFA because they didn't develop that specialization for words. Uh, and, um, and those who were expert readers had less uh, specialization for faces in the left VWFA. Same thing for houses, same thing for tools, same, except for letter strings. So uh, letters together, you would get the illiterates performing uh, poorly, while the, uh, those who are uh, well literate would do well. And even for false fonts, when you make up symbols that look like words but aren't, but have those angles and those shapes that are typically seen in words. And then when you go on to a blank checker, or like a control space, you see there's more representation in the, in the illiterates were more aware, uh, had a higher signal to that. Um, so some essential properties of the, of the primate cortex, as I mentioned, there's a hierarchical organization uh, from posterior to uh, anterior, anterior with increasing size of a receptive field of neurons with increasing appreciation of uh, complexity. So more uh, complex it is, the more anterior part uh, will be active. <coughs> uh, neurons have the capacity to integrate inputs from multiple uh, lower neurons. Uh, and sometimes, you know, this can be as low as in the V1 region where they uh, can recruit information. Um, there is plasticity, obviously, since people are able um, to develop reading. That's a sign of ongoing plasticity. And the occipital temporal, uh, and by that plasticity, I mean is basically ability to learn new skills and form new synapses. Um, the occipital temporal region is uh, traversed by a large scale gradient of extrinsicity eccentricity bias. So that means there is uh, things that are far away from your fovea or central vision are, are not going to be uh, represented as much as things uh, that are in the fovea or central. So everybody's familiar with this uh, logo and I'm not making any advertisements, but I wanted to point out everyone's attention that uh, there's a, a backwards uh, R, which I'm sure we all got used to by now. Um, this, um, and it's interesting because kids can read this uh, whole sign before they even go to school. Uh, there, this reverse R is just kind of a comment or taken from the fact that children, when they learn to read, and I think those of you who have children, you notice that when they read and write, they might write backwards, right? As if, you know, there's no difference between that. And so this is, uh, uh, in the childhood, they've looked at it in children, and and uh, they've, uh, children will sometimes try to read a, a word backwards. And uh, so this is an example where a child here is named Lissy, was given this amount of space and wrote her name this way. And then when they gave her less amount of space, she just wrote her name uh, backwards. Whereas the other child, Maggie, tend to write her name the same uh, way both times. The same thing here, she wrote it backwards. And so the trend to write things in reverse in children is, you know, is common at five years, almost half of them, even five to six year old, a great majority will still write in backwards. And then it begins to go off as they get older, as that their VWFA becomes more specialized and, more div uh, and begins to recognize. And so this is a sign of plasticity and uh, specialization developing in the, f in the word form area. <coughs> um, alexia is basically an inability uh, to read. So usually it's secondary to occipital lesions that involve the VWFA or its connections. Uh, it can be severe where there's no ability to read or it can be most commonly seen in something called uh, letter by letter reading where you actually, the person loses that ability to analyze everything in parallel and has to look at each single letter and then after he's read each of the letters he can then form a word. Okay. Sometimes even the, the letter itself needs to be uh, process separately to identify it. So there was a, a study to see if uh, they can induce letter by letter reading or what kind of features would the VWFA stop working and the person has to do a bit of letter by letter reading. So they tried rotating words in a different uh, angles and they tried spacing uh, between, the, between the words. And you can see a gradual spacing here. And then they tried changing the position of the words. And so um, with, uh, if I just direct your attention to the one in the lower left here, uh, which is the left occipital area, uh, you can see uh, that the uh, rotation uh, caused uh, some, uh, uh, an effect on the reading in which they were beginning to 
uh, read letter by letter once they were rotated by 45 degrees. And once spacing was about two and a half words, or two and a half spaces uh, apart, then there was also um, some uh, longer duration uh, to read. The letter, uh, the reading of the words slowed down. The reading speed slowed down. Position did not have an effect that much uh, on, on the brain. So we do know that there are some limits when words do not look like words anymore and they begin to look like separate uh, letters. Um, this is an, uh, an interesting study that was uh, trying to look at um, basically can, um, is, is there a role for assessing uh, the style of, of, of writing? Can we assess um, uh, handwriting script, uh, uh, different uh, fonts? And so uh, these, uh, there was a group of about uh, four patients who had uh, different uh, lesions in the visual area. Uh, so I'll show you these uh, four groups. Uh, here we go. This uh, first patient here had a, a right uh, inferior occipital uh, temporal lesion uh, and had prosopagnosia, could not recognize faces. Uh, this lesion, this patient here also had prosopagnosia and had trouble recognizing phases. Uh, this patient here also had uh, uh, prosopagnosia but had an anterior temporal. You can see the anterior temporal is missing. It's not, not like this one here. Um, and this is a patient had a left-sided uh, lesion uh, but it was a bit uh, medial. Uh, so, uh, and we wanted to know, or the researchers wanted to know their ability at sorting uh, words based on handwriting. And so their VWFA was um, active, of course, in these patients, but there wasn't, but this was when they were shown faces. So they showed these faces, uh, patients and their face center was damaged, so uh, there was a response appreciated in the VWFA. This is not a new response, this probably response was always there, and like I said, you do get overlap between the sides. <coughs> and so uh, what they did is uh, they gave them uh, some words and uh, were asked to sort them by uh, their font. So these fonts go together, this handwriting, this is there, there was multiple handwritings, all these handwritings are from the same person, then it goes together. And you can see how the control always performed uh, in seconds. So they were pretty quick at performing sorting according to uh, uh, the script or according to the word. So we notice that uh, if you, you'll see here in this uh, uh, particular uh, slide, there was some difficulty found for this one person who had a right-sided lesion. Uh, so same thing here. This is a person who had a right-sided lesion. So the impression of the authors was that is there uh, some difficulty uh, appreciating, the, uh, appreciating the style when you have a right-sided uh, lesion. Is there also a rule for the right side uh, when we read? While as word sorting was impaired but not as bad. It was, word sorting was bad in the person who had the left sided lesion. While all the other ones uh, performed reason but they seemed to have more trouble with the font. So <coughs> they wanted to uh, explore it a bit more and so they, uh, they had a very interesting study where uh, patients were given either uh, exposed to a word each time written in a different type of handwriting, or uh, I'll go to this column here, uh, different words but always in the same handwriting. Okay, so they kept, they controlled for the handwriting here, and here they controlled for the word, and this is just a basic uh, control where nothing is the same. The word is different and the handwriting is different. <coughs> and they look for something called repetition suppression. So what happens with the, with the fMRI is they can see if you repeatedly stimulate uh, the area, the specialized area for, uh, to perform a certain task, what happens is that this, the activation isn't as prominent as it is the first time around. So you keep repeating it, then we see the, the activation go down. Uh, so if that happens, that means this area is specialized for this task. And so um, you can attract your attention to uh, the handwriting here in the left VWFA, uh, even in the right side, actually. So there was suppression for handwriting in the left and in the right, and they were both uh, statistically significant. So uh, while they were predicting it all to be in the right, uh, as they saw in the patients who had the lesions, they found that, no, the left also is able to do this type of function. Uh, and it could be because of the left-sided ability in, um, in deciphering uh, script in general to come up with a letter. <coughs> uh, this is just an image showing uh, the regions that were involved, basically the uh, left VDLFA here. 
uh, they also found a trend. They found in the left that this activity was happening uh, more in the anterior region. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, things that are more uh, specialized require a bit more anterior part in the VWFA. Okay, uh, so going back to what I mentioned about the hierarchical coding of letter strings in the ventral steam. So there are some uh, features here. Uh, this, is, this is not English language, so they might not be familiar. Uh, but this is a typical word that's high frequency. The bigrams are known, the letters are known, its features are known. And on the other side of the spectrum is something completely foreign that makes no sense and made up symbols. And there's gradually uh, familiarity arises as they go up uh, the scale. And so these are just letters that don't usually come together. In this situation, you've got some uh, letters uh, that uh, are a bit uh, frequent, and these are a bit more frequent uh, bigrams. And if they wanted to assume that the visual cortex, cortex hosts uh, detectors for high frequency components, so any given stimulus is expected to activate the same detectors as the preceding one, plus additional detectors tuned at the next level. So uh, the detectors for this should be able to detect everything here, whereas the detector for this component will detect this and whatever is beneath. Uh, again, the similar regions were showing uh, activity, even for the false fonts, for the infrequent uh, letters. But you can see the kind of a, the activation was most prominent once things became close to words or words per se because of the specialization of these areas. Uh, same thing they showed, uh, just to get you to focus on this left side, uh, anterior to posterior uh, gradient, uh, where you get uh, most activation in the uh, anterior regions uh, just for things that are truly resembling uh, two words. And as you go more uh, posteriorly, uh, activation becomes more prominent for um, other um, items. Um, so another thing they're trying to figure out about uh, how the VDLFA work is how does it respond to a pseudo word? So a pseudo word is a word that looks like a real word, but isn't. Like if I say uh, get, G-E-D, it sounds like a word in English, but it's not really a word. And so <clears throat> these uh, should be able to be interpreted at least at some level in the brain, even if they don't have any uh, uh, meaning. Um, so there is a high activation seen in response to pseudo words. And it's assumed to result from partial and possibly prolonged activation of more than one uh, word entry. So I'll show you this example here. If a pseudo word here, which is stroat, there might be some components that look like street, some components that look like stroll, some that like, look like boat and float. And so there will be some activation uh, in the brain because it's trying to figure out this. And sometimes the activation is more prominent than reading words uh, because um, it's an unfamiliar uh, stimulus, and so the, it, the, let's say the, the brain is searching through its dictionary, trying to find the target. And so this study looked not just at uh, pseudo words, but it looked at uh, pseudo homophones. And in this case, in this case, you get uh, the actual word here, which is taxi, and then a word that sounds like it, but it's spelled differently. And then a word that is um, a pseudo word, a made up word that looks like it. And the same thing for the second word. And that's what they found. They f what, uh, what I mentioned is that the unfamiliar uh, strings, so these were unfamiliar, this was unfamiliar, they launched a search through the lexicon, resulting in longer reaction times and greater processing effort, by, evidenced by the increase in the bold uh, signal in these areas. <coughs> um, so this is another similar example of the study. Uh, they showed you for here, uh, uh, the patient is asked to look at the control set, which is just basically lines, and they compared the stimuli to the control set. So they're shown this while they're in the scanner. Uh, they've got tube, and another time they have a pseudo word that's flu. And then they're asked, do these words rhyme, basically? And so uh, this way you get the patient to pay attention rather than focusing on their ability to get it right uh, or wrong, if it rhymes or not. But you get the patient to pay attention this way, and so you always know that they're engaged. And this one here, is it, uh, does it sound like a real word or not? So you've got world, and then you've got world spelled differently with a U here, and they make these decisions. And uh, again, the same regions uh, were involved. Uh, the left VWFA, the temporal area, 
and the frontal. So it's interesting that there is even activation in the temporal and frontal regions uh, because uh, for true words, that's expected because these are areas of language. Uh, if you remember, when somebody has a Wernicke's aphasia, they have usually temporal parietal problems. If they've got an expressive or a Baraka's aphasia, they've got inferior frontal problems. And uh, when they're looking at the graph, at the, at the response, uh, you can see that in the occipital uh, uh, temporal region, uh, they all had a good uh, similar degree of activation. Uh, also in the occipital temporal region down here in the bars, uh, this was a statistically significant. Uh, it was more probably statistically significant for words in the language areas, although in one case, uh, pseudo-homophones did reach statistical significance in a language area, but uh, that's not surprising because it does sound like a word and a patient could understand a meaning out of a pseudo-homophone. So, in general, perhaps any type of orthographic symbol is going to be meaningful and can be processed at the level of the VWFA. Uh, so, for one example, uh, does, uh, does the VWFA respond to more than just words in this scenario? So, this study looked at words. Uh, it looked at uh, symbols. So, these are known symbols, question mark, peace sign, uh, digits. They used the language that was uh, Hebrew language that was foreign to the subjects, and they just used control with dots. And uh, they found that, again, in the left side, there was a bit more discrimination in these uh, stimuli, whereas in the right side, they were all processed and appreciated, but they weren't, uh, you couldn't really uh, differentiate the responses that well. But here, the language responses were much more higher uh, than the control responses. So even for words and symbols that don't, might not have, uh, might have some sort of uh, meaning, we'll show response. And again, you know, the type of symbol, the type of communication is very vast. You communicate with uh, music notes, you know, people read these and make uh, musical themes out of them. Uh, you can see a flag and recognize an identity of a country. You can see the, uh, uh, everybody knows the chrome logo or uh, the traffic sign. This traffic sign is an important one. You see the traffic sign and you know what, what kind of action to take. And so um, we looked at this one as well. We, had a, uh, we used words, uh, musical notes, uh, instructive symbols, and flags uh, to patients. And we also gave them uh, pseudo symbols or, or non-symbolic. So none of these uh, subjects could read Korean, so we used Korean language. We made up music notes we, and made up some uh, traffic signs and made up some flags. Uh, the regions that were identified were similar to the previous, uh, left VWFA, the temporal gyrus for language interpretation, and inferior frontal gyrus, these were the most responsive areas uh, in these patients. Uh, you can see with the uh, uh, written words in the left VWFA is uh, very uh, signif statistically significant, but it was interesting that the in this case, that the non-symbolic, the, the Korean language, actually was, uh, showed some statistical significance in this group. So did music, so did instructive symbols, so did uh, flags and uh, logos tend to have uh, some type of, uh, of meaning. Uh, there was also responses on the right side that I've mentioned uh, before that you tend to see. Uh, when you went for the language areas, <coughs> then you begin to see the dissociation, where definitely you know, the words were going to have uh, more meaning Musical notation was very uh, was significant as well, uh, and again uh, for the left inferior frontal region we saw that and we saw that for words and we saw that uh, for music uh, as well. Um, and this is just uh, all the areas that were uh, responsive uh, to the words bilaterally. We saw music have a little bit more uh, frontal involvement. You wonder if because a person has to coordinate uh, motor movements uh, to play that. Uh, music notes, so that might explain some of the activation in the other regions. Uh, a little bit of activation for uh, flags and, and, and uh, logos, but not as much as uh, the words. Um, <coughs> so the experience is uh, important um, uh, because with uh, when I was talking about more experience allows for better ability to interpret or higher activation in these uh, areas. And I'll quickly go over these graphs here. Uh, the difference between these two groups is this red line. This red line represents uh, the Hebrew language. So these used English and Chinese, and none of them knew Chinese. Uh, people uh, knew English, and this group also uh, were uh, Hebrew speakers. And they had a larger uh, 
uh, response here, which distinguished them from, of course, the group that didn't uh, uh, speak Hebrew. But they all had uh, similar responses. So th those who were more experienced in the language will give you that higher response. Uh, this is kind of a map when I was talking about the overlapping issues that you get when you say this is just a magnified area of the left of the occipital temporal uh, region. And you can see um, that uh, this sort of map here tends to be the word area uh, the most, whereas uh, the blue part is the object. And you can see how they clearly, you know, there's some overlapping aspects uh, between these. And so that's why interpretation sometimes becomes uh, uh, difficult. But this study used uh, similar to the images I showed you earlier, very breakdown uh, images of uh, objects, and they were able to find that there was a difference. It could isolate the VWFA. Um, so I just thought this was an interesting report that came out of a blind patient, uh, or actually several blind patients. Uh, but this is not um, this is not uh, an fMRI. This is a PET scan study, which is a bit more coarse in the information you're going to get. And it looked at congenitally blind patients, you see at the top, and patients who develop blindness later on after they learn to read, and uh, normal individuals. And they compared uh, Braille uh, in these patients and reading in the normal. They compared Braille with uh, hearing words. So of course with Braille you can see there was uh, activation, but they didn't have a lot of left-sided activation in the congenitally blind. Those who were previously blind and then they they were able to look at, uh, were reading Braille, there was a bit more activation in that area, which is uh, interesting. I think an fMRI study, if, if, if it could be done, would probably be more um, helpful, and, and you need to do some more patients to see why there was that um, activation. But it could be uh, probably top-down effects, which means that they see a word or they feel the word, and then that correlates with the spelling of the word in their memory and gives you some activation in that area. <coughs> Uh, this is a patient who had a stroke in the left occipital region. This patient uh, was uh, deaf and uh, spoke Japanese uh, sign language. And the Japanese sign language, there's two components. Part of it is, again, you make a sign language that gives a whole meaning, and some of the sign shapes uh, basically represent uh, letters. So he developed a sign language aphasia, uh, when he had uh, this uh, area, despite even his language regions uh, being intact. So this was a kind of a, uh, a strange uh, uh, situation, but it, it, uh, it tells you that uh, recognition of symbols and visual shapes is, is quite important in a uh, uh, function, even if uh, for sign language and hand gestures. So again, despite the numerous languages present so far, they've, uh, they all seem to activate uh, the same uh, VWFA. Uh, this uh, study looked at uh, languages, uh, for example, Chinese characters. These patients were bilingual. They could read Chinese and they could read uh, Korean. And they gave them repetitive stimuli along with uh, object. And they were all showing, again, activation in the same area and the left VWFA, um, and um, yes, uh, lastly here, um, I wanted to talk about uh, if you can read without your uh, uh, left uh, uh, occipital temporal region with a, a visual word form area. Uh, this is a, a report of a patient who in early childhood, uh, I think, or was it perinatal, there was an injury um, to the left side. So these images are reversed. Uh, this is now the left uh, side and this is the right side. Uh, so there was an injury in the left uh, occipital temporal regions that involved the VWFA area. Uh, the child learned uh, to read and had proficient reading skills uh, as, she, uh, as she got older. So We've seen this with patients who would have a lesion and then their language in the language area and then they develop normal speech because the language area has transferred to the other side of the brain. And this is probably what happened in this patient. So you can't always guarantee this uh, transfer, uh, but in some people they have enough plasticity that uh, it transfers to the other side. And this just shows you the extent of uh, her lesion uh, where, it, uh, where it is. Uh, on the left side, and then there is activity on both sides of the brain with the exposure to words. So in summary, I just wanted to mention that the DWFA represents kind of the pre-lexical step and uh, when you read a word, just before the definition comes in. 
it, it's responsive to small line, uh, lines, junctions between lines, and symbols as well. Um, it becomes more specialized and becomes uh, more dedicated to these words as time and as experience develops, and it is uh, able to detect whatever language the person is beginning to learn or uh, develop. Um, it's linked to other regions in the brain. It's closely linked mainly the language areas. Uh, and, you know, we've seen some of the effects of, uh, uh, of uh, lesions in the visual word form area where they wouldn't be able to, well, the main lesion is, um, is alexia, uh, developing these areas. Uh, with preserved, uh, interesting is that they have a preserved ability to write. <clears throat> if you have further involvement of more parietal or frontal regions, then you would get impairment of writing. But generally, if it's just isolated to the VWFA, then they'd be able to write something and not be able to read it. And with that, I'd just like to end my talk and uh, thank everyone for uh, their uh, uh, attendance and for having me here today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tim, for this informative, uh, highly specialized uh, lecture in the uh, word form area. And uh, so that means in, in our assessment for patient post-stroke, which involves the visual cortex, should not include only visual field and visual acuity. We should include also the other higher function. Is that right? Uh, yes, and, and actually, I, I tend to have, just because of my interest, I tend to have this habit is where I, I test the reading before I've established they actually have a field effect or not. I see the MRI and I want to go see how they do when they read. So most of the time, uh, the lesions, you know, uh, affect the uh, Patients will have hemianopia and alexia uh, because of these large uh, lesions. But uh, uh, sometimes you can get a little bit of uh, alexia and the hemi uh, if it's a small lesion, like a small tumor growing in that area, or somebody post-surgical resection of a tumor or such, where you can get relatively preserved uh, visual field. What about the rehab programs? Do you include like uh, altering shape, fonts, spacing? things in, in rehab in patients with alexia. Yeah. yeah, so unfortunately there's not a lot of alexia, patients with isolated alexia who are uh, good candidates for rehab because they tend to, a lot of them be, you know, somebody with a large stroke, somebody with uh, uh, degenerative disease or Alzheimer's. So there's not a lot of research on this area. There is um, sort of uh, challenges and attempts to get people uh, into reading again. Um, you would uh, start with the basic words and uh, and try to develop some sort of uh, uh, new plasticity um, in the brain by just uh, repetitive uh, trying. Uh, so basically through practice reading again and again. But it, it, it's sometimes uh, difficult for patients to, uh, to get this ability back, especially in the, in the older individuals. I'd like to open the floor for uh, comments and questions. Dr. Hassan. Any who? Spell. Mm-hmm. To recognize words by a couple of ways. Yeah. How to get easy for them so that they recall it back and they can't get one by one until they. So mm -hmm. uh, how that's working with normal people is happening to yeah. get this level of. Uh, yeah. Now, these uh, individuals um, have an additional probably skill of analyzing the roots of the words and the origins of the words and then kind of bringing in uh, the spelling rules. So a lot of them are spelling these new words that they've heard and they've never seen it before. They're unfamiliar. So they've internalized uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, the rules for how a word in a certain language should be uh, spelled. So it's not just, it's not really the visual form area here, it's probably more uh, talking about their uh, knowledge and their frontal functions as well, so parietotemporal as well. Dr. Fawaz. Thank you, Dr. Tim, for yeah. this uh, interesting lecture. My question about uh, this area, um, would it be uh, trainable? Can we do exercise to make it more efficient? And because we sometimes observe people, they are uh, reading faster than others. Yes. They just I'll read the article in like one or two minutes, and some people take five minutes or ten minutes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. <clears throat> so it's like, in general, reading is like any other skill. There is always people who are faster runners. There are always people who memorize better than other people. Uh, there is always that 
issue involved. So there's genetics, uh, genes play a role. Um, there's also a difference between reading fast and actually understanding what you're reading if you're, if you're reading it fast. So there's another component that helps is your ability to pay attention and stay focused, which is more frontal lobe functions. Right? So to read something quickly and to understand it uh, quickly, it requires, uh, of course, reading expertise and requires uh, having a good dictionary yourself in your head, familiar with words, so that when you encounter new words, you can recognize it quickly. Um, as well as fast processing uh, ability, that uh, you're able to link the information you're reading with the subsequent text, uh, you know, as it comes into view. Uh, so, you know, it, it, like if, you're, if somebody's doing it in their field of, of specialization, for example, that's where we all tend to read the most, uh, my recommendation would be uh, continue reading as much as you can. Uh, because that will increase your a broad knowledge of the words and what kind of words to expect. And once you can expect these, everything be begins to become easier for you. Uh, Dr. Tame, you talked about the, uh, uh, Professor Tamais, while I'm commenting. So you spoke about the children, the congenitally blind child, who their brain, uh, their brain was like so elastic where it's the, mm -hmm. the uh, word forming func uh, function went to the other side, which is the right side. No, this was not a blind child. This was the a child. Congenital. Yeah, she had an, an insult in, in early okay. childhood to the left occipital area. Okay. Yeah. So, so do you recommend like doing a rehab in children yes. more than uh, yes. adults? Yes. Uh, if, if an adult is, doesn't have anything that impairs them from rehab, they should always go into uh, a type of rehab. Do you have but such children? Rehab? Children uh, are different. You would uh, expose them because they have that chance of shifting things to the other side. There are even studies on patients who had intractable epilepsy and they had to take out half of the the, one of the hemispheres, so they have half a brain, and they were able to lateralize things to the other side uh, in some functions. Do you have speech therapists who are like specialized in such? Fi, uh, King Abdelaziz, there's a group who does uh, speech and language therapy and uh, they also come from the University of Khalid and we always refer our stroke patients uh, to them. I'm not of any, aware of anyone doing particular reading or rehabilitation, okay. uh, but definitely for language, uh, for aphasia as they do. Okay, Professor Tabara, sorry for that. Very interesting thing, it's so close to us and so far from us. <laughs> <laughs> You know, can you comment on the, when we do, we understand VEP, and we know that it measures the central vision, but how can you, uh, do you have any connections between the visual cortex that stimulates or that represents the fovea and this area? And you have connections? You know, vision is psychophysical. Mm -hmm. And there are connections, I'm sure, but my understanding is different than what you are stating to us. Mm -hmm. you know, because we never thought of an area outside the occipital lobe that gives you interpretation of certain visual mm -hmm. perception. Mm -hmm. So what is the connection between the visual cortex where mm -hmm. we see the central vision before you, let's say, at the tip of the cortex, Yes, okay, uh, very good question. So um, I just want to clarify, it is still considered within the occipital uh, cortex. It is uh, sort of the higher regions. So if the basic area is V1, maybe V2, uh, these are much more higher. But we've seen in fMRI studies that <clears throat> as soon as a C, you see a word, there is uh, probably some interpretation or appreciation even at the V1 level. And so there's probably neurons picking up basic elements, and then uh, other neurons begin to pick up those elements as well, and then it becomes well-defined in the VWFA. Never learn to read. There might be a response on the different side, similar to a response when they see a face, for example. Dr. Iman, last, maybe last question. Thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, I just want to know which patients do better, patients visual cortex while they ha he's blind because of uh, retinal disease or vice versa and rehabilitation. Which one do better to in have intact visual cortex but sick retina and blind because of abnormal retinal uh, uh, photoreceptor cells or the other way around? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. <coughs> so if, um, I mean, a person, the person who's blind, I, w- I would assume somebody who's blind from the retina, is, this, is he going to be reading by Braille? Right? Or, yeah. If he's going to be reading by Braille, then there's probably a communication from the sensory regions going directly to the language areas. Right? So if this patient knew words from before, there might be some activity in the VWFA. But I don't think the VWFA is driving the interpretation of Braille. I think it's, uh, it's activated probably secondarily because he already has that visual dictionary. So the, there's, it's a two-way communication coming even from the language areas going to the occipital area, causing that uh, signal. Now, somebody who's had an occipital lesion, if it's truly isolated, then um, <clears throat> I would have, this would have to be studied. Are these patients who have just have alexia, are they able to develop uh, ability to read Braille? And so that's something actually worth looking into. I haven't found much on it, uh, really. But uh, I would assume that they should be able to uh, develop uh, Braille. If they don't, then that gives me, that tells me something new about the visual word form area, that it, it's, uh, it might uh, respond to somatosensory sensation, which, which I would be surprised if it does. Okay, we'll come to conclusion. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tim, for this nice, uh, informative, uh, unusual lecture for us as a ophthalmologist. Thank you very much.